By and large, the way the company allocates resources for anything, let's say research or uh, computers or rent or like whatever, it's, it's through conversation, through multiple people, um, through discussion and debate, like this idea that like there can be a communicative rationality. So I think something, I try to communicate that, and then someone else gets offended or not get offended, and then they say something else. And after that conversation, both our ideas are better. And so, it's, it's, in general, that's how like, the office tends to work. Uh, even for projects, it's, it's not that, like, even while Zaha was alive, that there is Zaha's idea and then everyone else's is shit. It, it was just that, like, it was always confrontational. Like, you, you propose an idea and then someone else has to say something. It's, it's a kind of evolutionary process to, to arrive at the, the right distribution of resources. So. In, in particular to research, for example, we start with whatever is interesting, which doesn't consume lots of resource, either in time or in money. Like, uh, and then we, over several projects, build up the research uh, through collaboration, through looking at historic precedents. Um, so over 11 years that the group has been active, we have we have invested time and resource on several topics, uh, things like shell structures or curved origami, topology optimization or wood and so on, material based or algorithm based or uh, fabrication technology based, robotic fabrication and so on. And invariably it is some of the topics die if there's not communal interest in it. Or we put them on the back, back burner for a while and like after a while, like maybe there's more interest, more people are contributing to it. Uh, maybe the project needs it. Um, so yeah, we have project independent research, like the core thread is geometry, like um, that we continue to invest time always, regardless of what we're doing. We are improving our understanding of geometry uh, regardless, like so through our collaboration and because it doesn't take so much resource other than our mental capacities. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a bit back and forth for sure uh, between management, within projects, between institutions like these um, at ETH or at uh, Autodesk. Like, so it's, uh, we believe in this evolutionary process. So we start simple and through back and forth, like uh, that's why we do workshops and, and so on. Like, um, yeah, so, in, in nothing that we do, like we think that like we are the experts and like we have to do someone a favor. Like it is integral to our um, DNA, let's say, to collaborate. Um, and I think that's why we are kind of a robust company because uh, despite the image of the company, like uh, people are much more willing to listen and, and learn. Um, well. So that's how we invest. Uh, or make sure things go into uh, application most of the time because we're always listening. So, yeah. In many ways, we draw a distinction between art and architecture, and, um, and, and we sometimes use the art space for experimentation in the sense that it, it has like its own um, uh, opportunities, and you have some some of the less uh, some of the constraints are lessened. Like it, you know, you don't have to, uh, in many cases, contend with like severe structural. Um, uh, restrictions or earthquake engineering and so on. Um, but where art and architecture for us, like in, in, in that sense, is, is quite distinct apart from that, uh, is that 
artists like always are like kind of moving ahead of the time in a way they're asking different questions they're uh, they don't have to th so our task like you know in many ways like we inherited that artistic side from zaha who who wasn't like so logical in her thought process let's say like but she was asking many questions through her work and through her art and um and painting specifically and so when we look back like we have to think of like how to understand that kind of seemingly arbitrary process like in a rational way and that to us is the real value of uh, art and art art projects like because it it's it's like kind of uh, breaking the box and thinking outside of it like and when we see these examples of artists like whether it's Richard Serra or uh, even computational artists like people who use uh, photoshop like in a sculpting way like let's say zbrush and and so on um and then we try to think of like how you might r rationally arrive at that or what is some of the rationalities embedded in that artistic exploration uh, so that we can repeat it or kind of build on it. Um, so uh, art is super valuable in that sense because it's kind of like the intuition and, and the way they operate like they can operate in problems which are not well defined. Like. Uh, it's as though they're navigating in a in a dark room, like, and they have a kind of sixth sense of navigating there, and so, um, and that's how we tend to deal with art and uh, artists. Uh, we like collaborating with uh, all kinds of artists, like materi uh, material-based artists or even computational artists, and um, yeah, because they ask different questions. So, and and so again, we see it as a synergy, and like, there's. It's not compare and contrast, let's say, like we, sometimes we also put a, our artistic hat on and uh, try to fine tune our intuitive sense of uh, finding our way through, through certain questions. Yeah. Let's say my intuition is this, that like before like machines fully take over, where before there is like a full AI, full general AI, like there would be many more moments like uh, where it's human and AI together. Like, um, and so in that sense, it, it doesn't, it's not restricted to only the physical making of buildings. Uh, it could also be in the conception of buildings. It could be in the, um, in the, like, of course, the physical execution, but also like after execution, like how people occupy spaces and how that can inform other buildings or even the current building and so on. Um, <coughs> so we see, at least I see uh, AI like from the point of view of intelligence augmentation, like we have a certain set of evolved intelligence like as human beings um, and then like to me what would be really interesting about AI is like if it evolves a parallel competency like a different kind so it can search different search spaces uh, for solutions that we might not be able to even think of um, and obviously we also continue to evolve and that's like the beauty of like uh, evolution in the sense that and it's already been shown in games like Go and so on, that the first time AI beats the human, like it's always news. But like after that, it's not news that like the human got better, right? Like the, the human got like so much better like than where they were like two months ago. And um, so in that sense, that's also a power of AI. Like in, if, if, if it challenges uh, humans, like and, and humans like challenge, right? Like, I mean, that's, um, and I think that once we get to that stage of like constant feedback between us getting better and the AI getting better and like and then it's like a co-evolving species so I don't see that it's going to be AI versus humans or humans are going to be replaced or like we'll just continue to get better and like we'll get better faster with machines than without them obviously like so um, 
yeah, so in that sense, once we reach that stage, like, I think like the doors are wide open on where it can be used. It potentially could be used everywhere, right? Like, and, and not only in the conception, execution, like even what to build, for example, like um, understanding social dynamics, uh, political chaos, like all of these things, like, uh, like yeah, AI could help us understand. Yeah. Yeah, again, like in, in continuation of the previous uh, question and, and uh, answer to that. Uh, yeah, like I, I don't think like at least in, in our lifetime it will be human versus AI and, um, and, and if you think of design as a search, it's a search for solutions and however you define the problem, you're seeking a specific solution in, in a landscape full of solutions. So let's say the search space um, and design, and better designers get to the better solution quicker. Uh, but regardless, it is uh, a search uh, mechanism, a search process. If you think of it like that, then the role of AI and the role of designers like become quite uh, clear that like together we can explore this design space much faster and and also explore it much wider. And so, for example, if you if you're not machine augmented, uh, you might be forced to like only explore what's around you, what what you have done before, plus or minus a few few things. So, which is where traditions tend not to go beyond what they have already known, uh, because they're not augmented in their search capacity. So, like. Uh, so they, they won't deviate from what is known too much. Um, whereas if you consider AI as a kind of augmentation which allows you to uh, explore the search space much wider, and then subsequently it also allows you to exploit, like, uh, so usually a search mechanism is, is two-phase, right? Like first you explore broadly and then you exploit. So you find something that you like and, and or you think is appropriate and then you refine it very quickly. So search mechanisms are broadly categorized like this. First you need to have enough of an exploratory phase and then you need to converge into an exploitation phase. And I, I think in both these phases, AI can be very helpful because it brings in capacities that the humans have not naturally evolved to. Um, I mean, of course, we have evolved uh, lots of capacities. Um, that doesn't mean like that we, we, we could have had other skills. Uh, for example, our vision is not the best, right? like in, and so on. So we, we could use machines to see things that we don't see. Um, If you look back at modernism, and if you think, you know, when Corbusier started, he was making Swiss chalets, and a hundred years later, like his diagram is everywhere, like everywhere in, like from India to Sao Paulo to, um, so what changed? Um, of course, it was a combination of many things. He, he had to think, he had to design for the technology, like uh, concrete, and so he changed the diagram in a way. And, but also the technology itself had to be, um, become mainstream, like there needed to be engineering handbooks and there needed to be trade schools and there needed to be uh, many things that need, had to come together um, uh, for, for it to really catch on, like cement had to be mass producible, like and now every culture knows how to use cement. Um, and if you think about it, like, it's not that old a technology and so 
technology uh, is accelerating, obviously, but like I think a little bit of patience, uh, it will catch on because young people are seeing the benefits of it. Like, so it doesn't matter what like the, the dinosaurs are thinking. Uh, it, what matters is like what value younger people see in it because as soon as like this becomes integral to solving everyday problems, like you will go find the ways to learn it, right? Like, and, and that's, that's evidenced here. Like you're coming here from all over the world and like, and this is one of many places. And so, yeah, I, I think like I have fair amounts of optimism that it will catch on. Like, I mean, of course there are, like there are worrying signs like in architecture schools, like teaching, you know, like retrograde, return to modernism and like kind of watercolors and like these kind of things. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with watercolors, but is, is this kind of thinking that like somehow computers are like not um, compatible with like creativity is like, I think hopefully it is restricted to a few people. <laughs> um, and, and I see a lot, uh, the case for optimism is much stronger because at least in the 10 years that uh, we've been working, like I see knowledge is so readily available. Like when we started, like there was no grasshopper, no nothing. And, um, and like just in the last year, there've been like, I don't know, 10 different conferences. And like if each conference has like 40 peer reviewed papers, that's like, that's a lot of progress. Um, and so there is case for optimism and um, and even in our own work like when we started it used to take like something just to get something digitally made take like six months for four people and now we can collaborate between London and, and Zurich and Mexico and like across time zones and uh, within two and a half months we can get something from scratch to uh, a prototype at least made like that's that's progress too and um, so yeah, I think it is catching on, and, and, and the more it becomes relevant to solving everyday problems and opportunity, and problems doesn't mean like you know famine and poverty. <laughs> it means like making our cities better, me making our built environment better.